Well, where do we begin on this one? I don't really know, so let's get on with it. This is my old Pentium D workstation. I'm High Treason and as promised probably years ago now it's time we had a look at this Pentium D that I used to use really for just about everything. Long history on this machine, far too much to fit in this video, in fact I could probably write an entire 500 page novel about everything I've been through and this machine's been through, you know, it's uh, I go back quite a long way with it. It's, uh, yeah, unfortunately I'm not sure how good filming's going to be, it's quite difficult to get into the machine. Uh, dismantling it would take hours, so I'll do the best I can. Some of the pictures are going to be old, probably from when it was been rebuilt, so it's going to be covered in dirt, I would think, in that time. But, well, we'll get on to that as, you know, we'll make of it what we can. I think this video is probably going to be long, so apologies in advance. There's not much I can do about it, there's a lot to say, and trying to figure out what to cut out is a pain in the arse in this one because as I say there's just so much that could be said you don't use a machine for 12 years and have nothing to say about it this case has definitely seen better days these were sold by Kurt and Mackenzie in their Jupiter range but I think the manufacturer is actually Forex they're really solid cases I miss the other ones I had at the time I had three of them at one point and two of the mid-sized version but yeah, they, they were cheap and easy to obtain because they came from the same place as used by local government at the time. The, they favoured the Micro ATX versions because they were cheap and liked putting these little Pentium 3 motherboards in that didn't have AGP or anything. And they were kind of shit actually. As per usual, I beat certain other channels to the punch and added wood grain many years ago when the paint got too badly beaten up. Mostly because it was very cheap. The great thing with this tacky looking adhesive plastic is that you can always take it off again later and put something different on. At the front of the case there is a huge exhaust fan which pulls hot air from the CPU and GPU away from the system. You can see the water reservoir below this, it's a Swiftec Maelstrom V2, go on tell me you didn't read that as Maelstorm, everybody does which cost way more than I really wanted to spend fixing this thing up, but as it's the only dual bay reservoir not to use the absolutely useless lying D5 pump, there wasn't really much choice in the matter, and they can't even get these in this country. I had to import this from the United States, which seems to happen more often than not as time goes on. I might as well just move over there, life would probably be fucking easier. As for the D5, well, more on that later. The CD drives are pretty much for display only. They do work sometimes, but very rarely, and there's no point in them, because, I mean, this thing has gigabit ethernet on it, so... Yeah, why the hell am I going to use CDs? I do have the blank plates for the front of this case, but I can't be bothered to mess with that, and I think it looks better with the drives in. I, I mean, you know, they, they eject sometimes, so... Yeah, they're, they're a bit more appealing than just a flat surface. And they, they've always been there. These are the original two drives. I, I put the, the original drives back in. Under those is the Audigi 2 drive bay thingy. It seems to work, despite heavy corrosion from the old cooling tubes leaking onto it for a few years. Though somebody appears to have borrowed my optical plugs, naturally. That always seems to happen. I don't really use those anymore though, so I'm not too fussed. I can always clean the dust out if I need them again. Ignore the green strip of adhesive, that needs cleaning off, and it's proving difficult to clean off. There was a sign here that said no entry. There's a row of stickers that are doing better. Apparently this is an XP system, and we already know it has a creative sound card in it, which this sticker isn't from. Also, one of my go-to board makers, ECS, uh, Athlon 64? What a piece of shit that was. You see, usually this metal plate would cover that and the ECS sticker over. That being another ECS sticker from a board I don't use anymore, because those early 939 dual core systems just need scrubbing out of the history books. What a waste of money that was. This Pentium D sticker remains visible the whole time, because that's what's in here, and it's a much better solution. 
I don't think this is the original sticker though. I'm pretty sure it had a square one with a darker colour scheme at one time and don't remember what happened to it. I think it just sort of started peeling off and I put this one there. I kind of miss the old one. I think it looked better. Huge intake vents are at the bottom of the case, kept away from the floor thanks to large feet. Take note, modern case makers, why the fuck do you always put fans in the bottom of the case? It should be in the front like this. It's a computer, not a fucking vacuum cleaner. I'm forever having to clean the Xeon out because of this and I don't even have a carpet. I dread to think what it'd be like if I did. On the ass end is this thing which will fit 83mm waste pipe or tumble dryer hoses previously used to duct cooler air into the system from farther away. Then there's a shitty power supply. Then the shitty motherboard backplane. Look at that. Passive VRM cooling. This isn't going to end well. Stupid post woo a bit ideas. I think they might have lifted this from DFI, which is where Wu went, oddly enough. Or maybe this was one. Who fucking knows? Modern looking video card. No VGA ports. A capture card. The Audigi sound card. Holes. Take the side panels off and I know what you're thinking, but this isn't that. I cleaned this case thoroughly with soap and scrubbies and a hose pipe. It just won't come off. These are stains and thermal marks from running the damn thing flat out non-stop for over a decade. Yeah, sorry if you don't like it, but I actually used my stuff and this was my main machine for like 12 years or so, so it's had a lot of use and a lot of abuse. These things happen. First things first, this is not the original motherboard. Until the cleanup and rebuild a few months back, I used this ECS PF5, but it's had way too many years of hard service, and whilst it will boot, it doesn't seem too happy, it's kind of stubborn, and to be honest, I'd rather just let it retire now. It's got over 100,000 operating hours on the clock. Apparently this A bit has far less if the logs in the BIOS are anything to go by. I don't know if those are accurate. Both of these boards would have been out at around the same time, along with the Asus P5 PL2, and I'm going to tell you right now. The other boards flat out sucked. 2005 was weird for ECS because they suddenly decided to make some really high quality motherboards for some reason, probably just to troll Asus and the PF5 was one of those boards. At £90 it was vastly cheaper than its competitors, but it offered better features and better performance. If you dig around you'll probably still be able to find some really funny magazine articles out there which will tell you all about the performance in a bunch of charts like the ones I use, only significantly less tacky, then go on to tell you to buy the Asus or Abit board anyway. Because the ECS is purple, why would you want that? And the ECS is better at overclocking, but I mean, it, Asus didn't make it, so it must suck, right? Yeah, in fact, quite often they'll rarely even benchmark the PF5 against boards like this AWA, for one simple reason. Actually, you'll almost never see the AWA in comparative benchmark charts against other boards, for one simple reason. The AWA is by far the slowest of this group, and was also very costly, and imagine, largely due to these shitty copper heat pipes, a feature that will likely be the death of this motherboard eventually. Interestingly, Abit did actually make a water cooling block for this. Yeah, they actually did sell one. I even remember seeing it at the time. Uh, it was quite expensive. Because today there's no logical reason to own any of these boards. All of them are quite hard to find. There's our good 945P and 955X boards in general, and as you're not likely doing anything mission critical, any other board that can be found more easily and cheaply than these ones will probably do just fine. Although if you do have a PF5 that you want to sell, I might be interested in taking it off your hands. It could be in better condition than mine. Be warned though, if you're going to go and seek out a 775 motherboard for use with CPUs like I have here, Later chipsets appear to cripple the netburst processors somewhat. Whether this was by design or by accident, I don't really know. All I do know is that I've generally seen a drop in performance when using platforms like the P35 with the same CPUs. The chipset may be slower in general. I've, I've never hooked up like the Core 2 quads to a 945P, and I don't even think it would work. So, 
Yeah, it may just be the entire chipset is slower than the 945 and 955, or it may just be affecting the NetBass chips. I, I really don't know, and I don't have the tools to test. It could just be that I owned a bunch of particularly shitty motherboards with those chipsets on. I don't know. Either way, I, I prefer the 945 and 955. I'd better look with those. They're more era correct for these CPUs anyway. All that aside, this isn't a bit AWA Max motherboard. It's made after Wu left for DFI and effectively fucked over both companies. The design is simply horrible. It's not the worst but it ranks up there, if only because the suicidal cooling system is there. ECS placed a fan on the chipset and by the CPU voltage regulators. Abit decided to have no fans and cool them passively, and they already get much hotter. The ECS ones barely got warm, due to having more phases to spread the load over. The problem with Abit's heat pipe setup is that it relies on the CPU fan, and as you can tell, I don't have one of those. Not in here, plus heat pipes generally offer poorer cooling than solid heat sinks for the same given area, so yeah, a bit really fucked up on this one. It was a mistake repeated by MSI with a P35 board just a year or so later. Actually, it might have been three years, I'm not quite sure. This board seems quite a bit later. But this board doesn't work, because they didn't tell you any of this in the manual, and, well, it overheated and died, so... Yeah, don't run those on liquid cooling, because you'll just end up toasting the North Bridge. But then P35s run really hot anyway, so you're probably going to end up toasting those regardless. Of course, to make matters worse with this MSI board, yeah, the heat pipes actually do obstruct that power connector, so... Hmm, you can see how they tried to bend one of the pipes, but it doesn't really work. It's, uh, very poorly designed. But still, that's MSI for you, I guess. I don't really rate their boards anymore. They used to be okay years ago, but... Mm, started going downhill in the, the sort of fast half of the 2000s, I feel. Uh, also, there's no parallel port or serial port on this Abit board. Not even a header for them, despite Abit's marketing at the time claiming such features existed. Either way, there goes running DOS. Another reason the ECS board's better. Despite using the same ICH7R Southbridge, the ABIT can push barely half as much data per second as the ECS board, and as far as I'm aware, the ASUS ones. The, the ASUS boards are extremely anemic with the number of ports they offered. At least they didn't stuff them between the PCI slots or something, like some makers did. Nonetheless, you'll struggle to top about 120 meg per second with a bunch of the WD Blacks in Red Air on the AW8, which is pretty pathetic. We could get nearly 400 meg per second out of the ECS board doing this. As for the North Bridge, the ABIT does have the 955X chipset, and that should be more capable than the 945P the ECS used in some areas. It supports double the amount of RAM, 8 gigabytes, and is more likely to cooperate with CPUs that it wasn't really meant to run. In my case, I only have 4GB of RAM installed, but then I am using 32-bit Windows XP, so there's no real reason to install more. We can only see about 3 gigs of that memory in Windows, though, because this board maps it weird. We could get about 3.8 on the ECS board, so... Yeah, I don't really know what they've done there. Meanwhile, the CPU under that water block is an Intel QMUJ. If you've never heard of that, then I wouldn't worry about it. It's an engineering sample of the Extreme Edition 965, which, as far as I'm aware, is the fastest NetBurst desktop chip made at 3.73 GHz. A faster model was planned, but it never came out. Originally, the system used a QKDH, which is a Pentium D920, but it was upgraded to a 950 towards the end, which was a very good CPU, actually. I, I quite like that. If you want one of those and can't find it, just get the 945. I mean, it's the same CPU, but with uh, the virtualization technology on it. Meanwhile, the Extreme chip in here was only installed after the system retired, for no other reason than it was there, and why not? It's kind of cool. I'm not sure that you'll be able to find one of these. They seem to be quite rare, and... Yeah, I, I don't know how much point there is in really having one. It seems very fast, though. I, I kind of like it, and it doesn't dump that much more heat than 
the regular Pentium D, like at the higher clocks. To be honest, it does perform well. It also has hyper-threading, which the regular Pentium Ds don't, so... Yeah, it's, it's kind of a neat CPU. It's a bit after my time, of course, but I'm quite happy with it. I'm sorry I can't remove the water block and show you, but it really does just look like any other 775 chip. And if I take that block off, well, it's going to leak. The, the gasket's completely eroded in there, and if pressure is removed from the block, then water's just going to spill out all over the place. And I don't have any more fluid on hand to refill the system right now. I'd like to quickly point out that you'll notice the return tube does indeed return somewhere up the top of the case and doesn't daisy chain onto the GPU. It does come back down eventually though to cool the GPU with water that's obviously been somewhere else first. That GPU is an MSI GTX 460. Well, it's an NVIDIA GPU but MSI made the card. Has 1GB of RAM. Uh, yeah sometimes. I don't really do 3D GPUs, I, I don't really understand them all that well, and I have very little reason to use them all that often, so I have very little to say about it, aside from in factory overclocked, and it seems to be quite powerful. More powerful than I ever really needed, at any rate. In, in fact, the GT730 in my current Xeon workstation seems to be less capable than this card, but I just haven't noticed, because I'm, I'm not doing anything that demanding in 3D. It's, it's mostly 2D that I do. By the way, the GT730 is very fast at that, and it was very cheap, so... I don't think I'll be upgrading that any time soon. Still, this GTX 460 is somewhat defective, and a replacement is on hand. This was sent to me by somebody. I don't know who. I, I didn't buy it, and I didn't hand out my address to anyone, so fuck knows. It honestly creeps me out a little bit. The old card sort of went out. I didn't really tell anybody about it that much and suddenly a new one showed up in the mail. Although it seems there wasn't any anthrax in the box, so well thanks I guess. You see, there is an issue with this full cover water block, and I imagine any other full cover water block, in that it only fits a few models of card, and this MSI is one of those very few. I need some thermal pads and some gasket maker before changing to the replacement card. So apologies in advance for the signals coming out of it being a little bit pink and red due to a flaky RAM deck. Also it might only have 768 megabytes of RAM available on the card, depending on what kind of mood it's in on the day. Now the capture card, that's an Intensity Pro. Honestly, this thing has such a long story that it could have its own bloody video, but probably wouldn't be that interesting. The short version is that the card was absolutely shit when it released. Had buggy software, buggy firmware, completely missing or broken features. And I have to say, props to Blackmagic Design, because they actually tried their darndest to fix this thing, which is very rare to see these days. Companies will usually just give you the silent treatment, they'll hide... They'll do nothing to fix it and carry on like everything is normal. Blackmagic tried to fix this thing. So, credit where credit's due. Plus, fact, the Blackmagic cards aren't really built for the things I'm doing here. This whole capturing VGA signals thing, so... Yeah, it was always up against it in that regard. And it required the use of a Jeff N scaler box to convert and scale to a usable DVI signal with a HDMI adapter on it, which is passive, luckily, because the signal's pretty much the same. The Incensity Pro cannot change resolution on the fly, or frame rate. It requires this sort of thing be set manually, with you being able to select through just a few preset modes. It will shut the whole card down if your signal is the slightest bit off of what the card expects. One nice feature, though, is that you can do a real-time pass-through of the incoming signal with no latency, which I guess gets around the latency of firing things down the PCI Express bus. That's pretty nice. I'd like to see more capture cards do that, actually. That, that would be pretty cool. As far as I know, you can actually output the preview from Vegas through that pass-through port as well, and probably other video editors. I never really did that, because, well, I... It was easier to just put it on a second monitor, but yeah, that's uh, it's kind of a neat feature actually. I, I think more of them should do that. I have no idea what the USB connector on the back of the card's for. 
assuming it's USB at all. I mean, USB mini B cables fit, but I've never dared plug it in in case it blows up or something. One pro of using the Intensity Pro is that it records uncompressed video, so as long as your signal is good, you should get lossless quality, especially if you have a good enough driver array to handle the 10-bit modes. Unfortunately, we won't be doing that anymore because of the AW8 Max here being slower than hell as far as SATA interfaces go. I really don't know how they broke that. Also, the inputs on the Intensity are a little bit crap. The slightest bit of noise and the signal is going to look like shit. As you probably noticed towards the end of me using this workstation, the, the captures had all sorts of noise in them. All sorts of bleed. It really could have done with improvement there. I don't know if the later models are any better. Either way, they're uh, extremely sensitive to interference. The Audigi 2 probably needs no introduction. It's an ugly as fuck card with ugly wires hanging off of it. Somebody's got a bitch about cable management. I know what I'm doing. It doesn't have to look pretty. It's all As long as the airflow is good, who cares? The air's going where it needs to go. Leave it alone. It's not like I can see in here. In fact, I take pride in not being able to see in this machine. Whilst this machine was running, I forgot what the inside of it looked like because I never had to go in there. And that's why I don't like windowed cases. Because if I can forget what the inside of the machine looks like, that must mean I built it properly because it must work. Because it must mean I haven't had to go in there for a long time. That's my logic, but to each his own. I can see why you would like case windows and flashing lights. Hell, I've done it as well for the, the tech factor. Why the hell not? Nonetheless, it's no secret that I despise the Sound Blaster live cards. In fact, I throw them on bonfires and turn them into Sound Blaster dead cards. So why the hell my look with the RDG2, which is basically just an enhanced version of the same bloody thing, has been infinitely better is unknown, but I like these cards. They actually work. I don't know how the hell they made it work, given how terrible the other ones are. But yeah, these ones are good. The audio outputs on them are really noisy, though. Yet, the inputs are really good. And the features the card offers are pretty great. And to be honest, you can get around the noise of the outputs just by cutting the ground pin off of your speakers. So, uh, yeah, that'll do it. Cut the ground pin out of the signal wire. No more ground loop, because there's no more ground. Of course, you're not going to get such a full-featured card as the Audigi 2 today, because modern operating systems don't really let you use them to their fullest extent, so you can't really blame the manufacturers for not making things like this anymore. It'd just be a waste of time and money, and you could probably put your R&D department to better use, I suppose. For me, this card was always a good choice due to offering more than one MIDI interface, working SP diff input and output, along with a bunch of analog inputs too. Lots of analog inputs. Uh, plus you can replicate the analog output over more than one socket at the back, and of course it'll always come out with a headphone port at the same time unless you've set it not to. It's a good sound card, but with that, that's really it for the cards in this system. Uh, although there is this little slot here, that's, that's for a sound card that Abit made. Yeah, I think it's like the Abit Sound Max or something. It's just generic Realtek Kodak on a card. It's kind of a waste of a slot, really, to be honest. The hard drives are 2TB WD black drives. These are going to be swapped for smaller drives because the board struggles with them. In fact, it becomes quite unstable. Abit did update the BIOS for a few years, but it seems they never bothered to include an updated ICH7 ROM within it, so the RAID BIOS is really outdated. Regardless of this, I have stuffed the discs into RAID 10 for now, but they'll be getting replaced with 250GB models later, as I really can't ever see this thing having to record like 6 hours of uncompressed video ever again now. It might do the odd little 576p thing just to help out. Who knows? Oh yeah, 480p modes don't really work on the Intensity Pro, which sucks, that's what I bought it for. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, so we were kind of stuck with 50 hertz for years. In the past, the system had an older analog capture card in it alongside the Intensity. In fact, originally it just had the analog capture card in it. But that card went kind of bad and left me unable to record all consoles or VHS tapes for a few years. 
not without using some other machine and less quality so yeah now you know why there wasn't any trace of anything like that on this channel for a very long time we can record that again now but I just don't know what to do with it maybe I'll come up with something it is October after all I don't think I'll be able to pull this out of here without ruining everything so it's probably going to stay in there but the CD-ROM drives are on a four port cable I suspect it was actually an MKE cable five ports counting the one that plugs into the motherboard it's one of the only cables long enough to reach the top of this case and it will reach the topmost slots the reservoirs only placed higher in there simply because it's better for any air bubbles that are in the system they're more likely to end up going into that reservoir and not getting pushed back around the power supply could be better there, there was a seasonic in here but it had way too many yards on the clock and it was making some funny noises it probably would have been okay but yeah this took its place might replace it later it seems to be working for now it seems decent quality inside actually it's a fairly cheap power supply but it actually seems to be quite well made if it does get replaced then hopefully it won't be a stupid modular design or have multiple rails like this one I hate that shit they take up too much room and they cause too many problems just, just give me a single rail supply that doesn't have these stupid connectors on the back I can't stand it honestly whoever came up with this idea I I hope something horrible happens to them I really do I, I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart like I don't want them dead they don't deserve that I mean something like perhaps using a contaminated needle the next time they shoot up something like that that would be more fitting my radiators are currently hooked up in the wrong order but the plan is to cool the GPU with the one farthest back and then cool the CPU with the one farther onwards although the CPU appears earlier in the loop it does work but obviously having the radiators like this isn't ideal still the loop is over engineered to hell the radiators are quite large and the fans push a fair amount of air through them so yeah we can totally get away with this in fact we can sustain several fan failures in this thing actually we are because this backmost fan has failed whilst I was recording this it now doesn't work that sucks well it was marked for replacement anyway so mm, I guess we'll have to do that more urgently now guess I'll buy deltas next time lesson learned even with that fan fail nothing's really gonna go up to like 50 degrees celsius or anything yeah I, th I think still just on the one radiator fan now probably gonna get 47 celsius max and that'll be on like the GPU after loading it for hours so the, this cooling loops doing its job I don't really see any means of improving it without doing serious modifications to the case there used to actually be a hard drive cage up here where these radiators are now let me tell you something about liquid cooling that bothers me to no end so many times will I see somebody daisy chain their CPU water block straight to their GPU water block sometimes dual GPUs maybe even then hard drives or RAM use one radiator and then complain that liquid cooling is no better or even worse than air cooling no it isn't you're just doing it wrong also these dem d5 pumps are now the only option you can usually find and they're absolutely useless don't buy those honestly buy this swift tech thing that i've got get the mcp 50x or whatever it's called instead because that works and it won't rot your loop out i'm in utter disbelief as it seems the engineers behind the d5 failed high school science in fact grade school science would have probably taught you about this because the lying d5 has a brass impeller which is fused to an aluminum rotor which sits in the fluid this is a wet rotor design and of course the loops mostly made out of copper and brass it doesn't take a genius to realize that this thing is going to start causing galvanic reactions really really fast assuming your system even runs for long enough for that to happen because the d5 pumps are quite prone to air locking and wrecking their bearings now those bearings themselves are another problem because they're just graphite rings on a ceramic ball 
so they're going to fill your loop with graphite particles over time. It took only a few days on a D5 pump to see the fluid turn a very strange green colour and little lumps of graphite appear. The pump was noisy, it lacked the power or flow to push water through the loop adequately, barely a trickle was coming back, in fact even without any stress on the pump, just a straight tube, it doesn't move much water at all. Naturally this meant the temperatures went really really high, and the overheat switch even triggered on the CPU at one point. I had to pressurise the loop to even get the water through because the D5 could not push the air out of the way for the water to return to the start of the loop. Honestly, they're just shit. They don't work and there is absolutely no advantage to using one of these pumps. I don't know how they became the most prominent option. They were around when I originally built the loop well, I am going to have a kick off, but you can see, same, same model, 10 years apart, same model, exactly the same, only this one uses just under a half of the power, and uses a crappy D5 pump. Still, we've got a new loop, should be able to pump around that, that's not going to require too much power, is it? Got a power supply running again, there we go, and we have water. And my crackpot idea is this. I have this, it's gone off, but it's reasonably acidic. It looks kind of gross, I'll admit. It, it looks a lot like something else, but <laughs> that smells all right, actually. Then, ooh. There we go. And if we just leave that running, it should, uh, I can see already it's getting a pretty scummy looking substance up top though, which is what we want. So look, this thing actually pushes water around a tube. That's way more than that other pump could do. Uh, I'm just going to put a lump of tissue there. <laughs> put a lump of tissue there, keep an eye on it. We might be alright. And I've still got some apple juice left, I'm going to go drink that. And I, by now I've learned that if it's the worst option it will become the most prevalent option. I don't know how they became so prevalent. Of course, now you will be hard-pressed to find anything else. Either way, both my old boxy-looking thing here and the Swift Tech are far better. They're quieter. They have higher pressure and better flow. They're also not going to cause as many galvanic problems, if any. Hell, the old one definitely won't. It has a plastic fucking impeller on it and a sealed rotor. And it's damn near silent. This Swiftec MCP pump either uses a plastic rotor or it's coated with something to stop it actually contacting the fluid. It feels like plastic. That's a lot better. You don't want to expose brass and aluminum in a copper loop. What idiot thought that was a good idea? Of course, the worry of galvanic reactions would be less of a concern if you could actually buy decent coolant instead of just purified water now. Now, they won't tell you it's purified water, but they will give you a data sheet about the stuff. And it's odd how the properties on that data sheet just happen to match up with purified water. Yeah, boiling point 100 degrees. Hmm, pH 7. Non-toxic. That's what this shit is. It's water with radiator inhibitor in it. Maybe it has a weak biocide in there, but apparently you can drink this stuff and nothing will happen, so... <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to try that, but I don't think it can be that good of a coolant. It smells oddly of apples as well, I've noticed. <laughs> Fuck this, I want my ethylene glycol stuff back. This shit used to burn if you got it on your skin. It had a really nice sweet smell to it, though. It was far more effective. I, you just can't get it anymore. I suppose maybe you could get, like, car or truck coolant or something. Maybe probably has a similar formula to this old stuff. I might have to look into that. Oh, also, I can't get the Norprene tubes anymore that I used to use, so I have to use these rubber ones. And even then, I, I can't get the right size. They're all metric now, and finding ones that will fit on my 3 8 inch Imperial barbs is a pain in the ass. These ones fit, but they're really tight. And I'd rather they were too tight than too loose. I mean, it's, 
you know I could probably make some analogies there. I'll just leave you to do it. That one's too obvious. I'm not going there. Either way, these hers are quite thick. It's a thick black hers, so yeah, that should last quite a while. Now going back into lecturing you about how to do water cooling, secure your damn tube. So often I see people bitch about leaks happening in their loop, and all they've done is push the tube over the barb. Now you might get away with that, but it's better to be safe and use Jubilee clips over the barbs to hold them on. Hell, just use cable ties if you've got those and you don't want to fork out for the Jubilee clips. Though you can buy a bag of like 20 Jubilee clips for pennies. Get the shit ones from China if you have to. It's better they're not secure in the tube. I've tested thoroughly and this loop can withstand mains water pressure against a blockage without a single leak happening. It blew the seals on my old reservoir, but that was already cracked, and it was already leaking, so all it did was make an existing leak worse, and hell, that was way out of warranty. Like, that reservoir had run for nearly a decade, with very low maintenance that should have been done to it that wasn't done. It had been neglected, so that was bound to happen. But still, this was with the old Parish Norprene tubes. I've tested again. The loop in its current state can withstand mains pressure without blowing anything. This is a high pressure area that I live in, so this was pushing it. The loop stood up to five bars of pressure without issue. Leaks aren't a problem for me. Those hoses aren't going to leak. They're not going to blow off. Because who wants to be blowing off black hoses? I mean, I don't want to do that. I'm sure someone's into it though. But it depends how much you're paying, I suppose. If, nonetheless, think about the radiator in your car. That has to take quite a lot of pressure when the engine heats up, especially if something fails, and they don't just push the tubes on, they always use clips of some kind. Think there might be a reason for that? Also, use black tubes unless your machine is a fashion statement. Honestly, if it is some fashion statement with a window in the side, it's not so much of a problem, because you're building it more for looks than functionality in that case. But otherwise, use black tubes, because they stop the light getting into the fluid, and it it stops things from growing. I mean, sure, you've got a bio side in there, but you don't want to encourage it. And this is going to do a better job. This will work as well as the bio side to stop things from growing, because now there's no light getting into the fluid, aside from the front of the reservoir. I mean, sure, you can't see the sludge building up, but you won't have as much sludge buildup if you built the loop properly, which basically means rooting the tubes properly, not using the similar metals, using black tubing to prevent algae and bacteria from growing in it, and generally not doing stupid things, and using a proper pump that's not going to push the water through so slowly that it gives the sludge a chance to build up. If anything happens in this loop, it's just going to come back to the reservoir because the water's moving around it quickly enough to do that. And your reservoir should be somewhere up the top of the loop. Also, the return, the output on the blocks, should always be at the top if possible. Same for the radiators, as this lets air bubbles escape. Especially when you're using a water-based coolant like this, because bubbles will form in it, and this way they'll always return to the reservoir, and they'll just get stuck in the top of the reservoir when you can bleed them out, pour more fluid in. And there's another very important point about liquid cooling. Always use PTFE tape on your threads. Now, with all that out of the way, no, I haven't turned gear, there really is an LED fan in here, and there is a legitimate reason for it. By placing it between the two radiators like that, I can look through the radiators and see if dust has built up inside them. At the moment, they're still quite clean, and would usually take a couple of yards to dust up. Of course, the last few years had the system not cleaned at all, so they started to look really, really gross. Actually, the whole system looked really, really gross. Yeah, that's quite unpleasant. Believe it or not, it still ran just fine with this level of dirt on everything. Didn't really car that much. I mean, yeah, there was a bit of a temperature increase. It, it smelled funny, but it did just fine. Everything was within tolerance. That's why you should over-engineer these things, as said before. Always assume something will fail. Because it probably will, and if you can withstand that failure, it gives you a chance to do something about it. Oh, fans broke. That's all right, I can run without it until the new one gets here. Oh, but my lo loop's a bit sludged up. Mm, that's no problem. You know, my pump's strong enough. It can last until I can get cleaner. Just use vinegar. 
I used apple jelly. I used fruit juice to clean my water loop out. I mean, look, I know I'm going on and on here, but it's... Like I say, it, it does arc me out. I see people make mistakes. It doesn't bother me so much, because, I mean, it's their thing, but... It does when they then come back and say something's rubbish a little bit. It's like, well, no, it's not. You're just not... You're not using it right, you know? Uh... It's, it's like anything, you know, you should always go a bit farther. If you're going to put a power supply in, don't buy a cheap shit power supply like I have in here. Get a good one and make sure it's bigger than you need. Power supplies are going to be at the most efficient, at like 50 to 70% load or something. So, yeah, that's that's where you want to sit. A little bit of room for upgrades later. Get better fans than you need. Don't use temperature control because it's annoying and it also wires them out because... Fans, like any machine, are built from the perspective of them running, so running them at full speed the whole time is going to lubricate them better. You know, it's things like that. Have too much cooling, have too much power. It's, it's uh, You can't go wrong. Always secure everything with as many screws as you really need to. Things like that. It's uh, okay, That's kind of hard now. A lot of cases are screwless. But I figured I'd just go on, on, a, on a rant about that, because I felt like that. Anyway, just turn the machine on and run it. Well, I'm sure somebody's going to ask what this thing sounds like when it's firing up. So, well, here we go. I've got nothing to show you. It, it plays Mirror's Edge, I guess. Where is the top? Right fucking there. Biggest, baddest puzzle the game has to offer. Let's do it. I tell you what, man. I think we could do this in one go. If we, we put our minds to it. Okay. Right, what we need to do here is that. And this bit, this is tricky. Don't like this bit. <laughs> oh man, it's intense. It's intense. Heart is beating out of my chest right now. Oh fuck. Holy fuck, man. This is some serious shit, man. Oh fuck. Okay. Almost there. Slow down. Slow down. It's this way, isn't it? It's this way. Yes, it's this way. Okay. Uh, where's it now? Oh, right. I get it. I get it. I'm getting ahead of myself. Right, this bit's fucking hard. This bit's fucking hard. I'd rather grab it at this stage, man. Don't want to. Don't want to. Don't want to lose it. What was that shit? Get up there. There we go. Okay. Oh. Oh fuck me. Deep breaths, deep breaths. Should be oh. Kind of bed near you. Oh. oh, fuck. Oh, man. Now you don't know what I sound like when I fuck. <laughs> I don't know. Do I really have to show this stuff? I mean, this machine edited and rendered hundreds of videos for this channel alone, including the very fast. It clocked up over 100,000 operating hours, and it was behind much of the music I slapped together to some extent as well. If you're wondering at what point retirement happened, then rendering to the main channel pretty much started winding down around the time of In My Dream on this channel, though the music had to be made with the T3200SX and the Pentium 66 due to buffer issues the Audigi 2 was having, largely due to a coolant leak. The final piece of music this machine worked on was a Nightmare 3D cover, the last ever render before standing down completely was Duke Nukem 2 on the second channel, and its only remaining job was to complete Mirror's Edge on that channel, with the Xeon capturing and editing, demonstrating this old workstation, showing its age and stumbling towards the very end, leading to a fairly epic rush to the finish, or something like that, as everything started falling apart. This machine also did the work when building Duke Nukem 3D levels, and a whole bunch of other stuff. 
it worked hard, it did its job. In video rendering, it could actually beat the later Core 2 CPUs most of the time. In fact, it starts tearing ahead in certain standard definition jobs especially, making me wonder if the CPU has some kind of optimization in its design for this particular task. DVD was still the dominant format for home video at the time, and Netburst has always been very strong when it comes to fairly linear tasks like this. It had lengthy pipelines that may have been a problem in games, but, but they were a good all-round CPU, and they were stable. Of course, the early Netburst were absolutely horrible, like Socket 423 and such, which I always forget even exists, but yeah, Intel fixed this towards the end. But then I think the damage was done though, and it didn't matter how much they fixed it. Pendium 4 had negative connotations, and people weren't going to buy it. Although, as I said, these later ones, like these Presler cores and such, seem to perform very well. They don't seem to have as many heat problems either. Naturally, for their time, they're not bad. I mean, it's like 2005 technology, everything ran hot. These are far from the worst. In video rendering, they're absolutely fantastic, and as I said, if you do like MPEG-1 and MPEG-2, it's very fast. I, I do wonder if there's some optimizations in its design specifically for that job, just due to the abundance of that at the time it was made. The Core 2, on the other hand, only ever seemed to perform well at games, and I've always had stability problems with those, especially the chipsets they used, so upgrading to one of those was never really an option, and it would have been a step back for me. I don't really want to play games all that much, and the Pentium D got through the first two Crisis games quite happily anyway, which I think is a good enough benchmark to set. You can probably see Passmark running by now, and yeah, I'm not even going to read out the scores, but I'll show the baseline file, it doesn't matter, the system's proved itself in the 12 years it was doing all the work behind the scenes. So fuck the scores, also the AW8 Max board really does score quite badly and... Well, it's having issues with RAID again and doing a rebuild, so the disc scores can probably just be completely ignored as they're going to come out horrible while the array's rebuilding. The intention always was to replace this machine after three years somewhere in 2008, but that coincided with me moving out of the institution and into my own house. So this delayed it, and things always got in the way. The three year window came and went, with me being too busy and too poor. Every year there were more obstacles, and before you knew it, six years had clocked up, and it was still there. Nine years went by, and it was still going, but it required some repairs. In the end, repairs started to build up, and it would have cost a lot to fix, so I opted to patch it up as best I could, as in do a complete bods job, and just run it into the ground whilst saving up for the Xeon, relying heavily on the fact I would get a disturbance payment for being forced to move to the house I'm currently in, due to corporate and government bullshit, eventually upgrading to the current Xeon, 12 years on, and 9 years after the planned upgrade window had long since sailed by. Still, it got us there, and there's not really... I think that's a testament in itself. I don't think really much more needs to be said on it. it it's done what it was supposed to do, and it's, it went way beyond what it was ever supposed to do, and it still did just fine. Yeah, it started to feel a little bit slow towards the end, but not as bad as you might think. To be honest, I would have probably quite happily sat on it for another year or two if, if it hadn't needed so much fixing up that I wasn't willing to put the money into at the time. But what is, but what will be, will be, and the Xeon's here now. It's doing the job faster, it's doing the job better, I guess. Everything has to move on, things can't stay the same forever, but hey... This thing's a good museum piece now, I, I don't really have much use for it, but I can't bring myself to part with it. I, I've been through too much with it. When you think it saw me out of childhood into adulthood and everything, you know, it's... Yeah, I've uh, been through a lot with this system. Anyway, I guess I'll pass you back to that cameraman, and I'm sure this one's turned out really long, but, well, who cares, what does it matter? That's kind of par for the course by now, I guess. I think that's about it, there's probably not really 
Well, there is a lot more to say, but I don't think it's necessary. I think we've gone on long enough. You get the idea what this thing is, what it does, what it looks like, what it used to look. Well, not so much what it used to look like. Obviously, the hardware used to be a bit different. Like when it was first built, it actually had 12 hard drives in it. I mean, we didn't have the water cooling because I couldn't afford it. And that was largely because of the hard drives I'd put in. So, yeah, we had the uh, drive bay extender. There was a drive cage up where the radiators were. The five and a quarter inch bays had hard drives in them. And it was the only way I could get there then. I was determined, like, I'm going to get past this, like, terabyte barrier and I'm going to go past the two terabyte barrier. But the biggest drives I can get are only 250 gig. Mm, I, I want to get there. I've had this massive raid card and they were mostly IDEs. Like, I, th I think they were all IDEs that long ago. I know I still have a few left. I'm pretty certain they're IDE. So, yeah, it was probably all IDE. I don't think we used the SATA ports. It was like a card I had plugged in. It was the only way we could... I mean, we could have done SCSI, I suppose, was still around, but only just. And I, I think that would have cost too much. And I always plans to upgrade it later. Uh, video card was this ATI FireGL V3100. Horrible thing. And the name's misleading, I never once saw it run OpenGL, it just seems completely incapable, which was a bit of an issue with ATI for a time. And that was what sent me back to NVIDIA, because I'd sort of favoured ATI up to this point, but... Mm, mm, no, not, not after that, because I was working with GL at the time, and so that put holes in things, like big time. And... I couldn't run Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness, which was the first game this system ever ran. I could run Flight Sim 2002 Pro, but that doesn't really use the video card. That's pretty much CPU bound. And that ran alright, ran pretty good on this. I don't know that it was multi-threaded though, and I no longer have it. I'd like to go back and check that sometime, maybe, but I'm not that interested. Uh, sound card, I don't think the Ordigi was there originally, in fact I know it wasn't, it had one of those shitty Ordigi 4s maybe? I I've had some people say they're like, called the, the Xi-Fi or something, and they have like four sockets on the back and events output seven channels. It's all shared port nonsense. It never really worked that card. I, I thought I still had it, but I got a suspicion it might have gone on the bonfire. It, it was crap anyway, so I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, yeah, a few hardware changes. I know there was like a 7300GS video card. There was the 9600GS. So I really liked that card. Had a 260GTX because it was on offer because it was old by then. And obviously moved up to this GTX 460. So hardware did change over the years. Obviously CPU got upgraded from the, the 920 to the 950 and finally the 965 after the thing retired. So yeah, long way. And really it's the last machine I built in childhood, I guess, or the last main one. You know, I would only been like 14, 15 when I built this. And I, I think that's covered all of them from that time because it's a time I reference a lot, kind of the Athlon 64 fucking up and me being completely out of money having to start the beginning saving again but needing the machine to get work done for like college and stuff which I was already starting to get into and video editing course and just all sorts of shit I needed a machine and so I had to use that fucking 486 you know, it's something I've talked about a lot and yeah, this is kind of the end of that chapter was this machine finally to get there get the thing built and be like, yeah, okay, now we've got some of that fucking wax. Only it didn't, I had problems with it. I hated it when I first built it. I, I found it boring, to be honest. I, this is beyond my time, this machine. This is when they've just become a tool. It's probably the last one that I'll run that has any personality, as it were. The, the Xeon I have now, I, I'd be upset if it broke but I don't feel any attachment beyond, you know, that it's a tool that I need to get things done. Whereas this, it was a tool I needed to get things done, but it still had just enough of that magic that the older machines had. You know, that uh, I would be upset if something happened to it, but not as much, necessarily. In this case, I probably have more 
car towards it than I would just for how long I ran it. I mean, as I said, it's 12 yards, it's a long time. And it was showing by the end, it was starting to feel a little bit anemic, but it did well, you know, we did HD video editing on it and stuff, and it was fine, it didn't really stumble. It was, it could do 720p 30 editing just fine, could render it in a reasonable time frame. I mean, the last few renders like that we did, I, I think were taking like upwards of eight hours sometimes if they were more complex, but yeah, what are you going to do, you know, it wasn't really, you know, this was years after it was done, they were fairly long videos. The camera doesn't help because it will only shoot interlace mode really. You can do progressive mode on this one, but it's like 50 frames per second progressive, and the resampling time for that is way longer than the interlace mode that it has, so I just shoot an interlace mode. I hate this camera, I, I'm going to replace it at the end of the year. <laughs> Given that we seem to manage one or two videos a month, yeah, I've probably only got like four videos left in this camera tops if all goes to plan. Thank fuck for that because I've never liked this damn camera and I've used it for two years now. But anyway, I could rant on and on and on all day and I'm not going to. Long history on this machine, but either way, we've seen what's in it, we've seen what it does. There's a, the baseline from pass marks in the description. I'm not going to bother running DOS benchmarks on it. Uh, I'm sure someone else has. I, I can't remember if Where Back Tech did any benchmarks on any NetBar stuff like that. Uh, somebody somewhere must have done, and basically you'd be quite surprised if it's not something you're familiar with. It's not going to come out that fast in DOS if we were to do that. Like, my Athlon would probably be roughly in the same league, I think, or at least it would be closer than you would imagine. Like you could probably start being quite convincing with a Pentium 3 against it and that sort of thing. They just weren't designed that way anymore. The video cards were starting to drop the the modes, you know, the support for the modes DOS used beyond what was absolutely necessary to get the machine up and running. So, yeah, you know, it's it's not really suitable for that. It has run DOS like years ago. I ran like Windows 2 on it just off a USB stick for a laugh. But, yeah, it's... Uh, it wasn't ever meant to do that, and so it's not something I really care about. And obviously that Passmark baseline is going to be crippled because of the array rebuild going on, and even then the hard drives are causing stability issues. I get those replaced with 250 gig ones, but the installation of Windows now is going to be exactly the same, so you know, it's, it won't require any update video or anything. It's just the way things are. But, anyway, this is October, so I'm going to try and get something done for the end of the month, maybe. Don't know how that's going to go. But right now I've got to eat, I've got to see to my pet rats, because they're nagging me to go and play with them and stuff. So yeah, uh, I'm High Treason, thanks for watching. And remember, don't be a screw-up, load DOS 622 up. Oh, I'm going to keep saying it, as I've told you, I'm, it's not going away. That's, that's here to stay now. Oh no, I'm just, that's, that's even worse. I, did, I didn't mean that one, honestly. That was an accident. Ah, oh, yeah, now you'll notice the wallpaper on the desktop. That's Alyssa from Clock Tower 3. That's where the name of this machine came from. You know, it's actually a pretty cool wallpaper. Maybe I should put that on socks and sell it or something. I mean, I don't know about this Capcom Entertainment. I'm, I'm sure they wouldn't have an issue with that, but... I don't know. This game's not very popular. It's not very well known. I, I guess I'll have to have a look around the internet and see what's popular now. Well, th this seems to be pretty popular. I guess maybe I could put that on a t-shirt and sell a few of them. Maybe. I mean, I'm sure that's not going to be any issue with intellectual property rights, surely. Yeah, right. See you, Desmond.